Good afternoon. Today was going to be a very brief discussion. I feel like I didn't do the Kansas-Nebraska Act justice in Wednesday's talk. So I just wanted to discuss it a little bit, but also want to discuss how Abraham Lincoln is re-entering the picture here. And Lincoln, for the majority of his political life, was a member of the Whig Party. Uh, he was a committed Whig at that. He supported economic development policies of the party. He believed in development of the nation's infrastructure, canals, roads, railroads, to connect cities and farmlands. He supported tariffs to produce funds for the work and to protect American manufacturing interest, uh, manufacturing interest from foreign competitors. And he also supported banks to help fund these improvements and to encourage them to make credit available for people. And these are the tenets of what Henry Clay called the American system. Trade throughout the country and making each section interdependent. Strong pieces creating an even stronger whole. Now, Lincoln was a Whig state legislature in Illinois from 1834 until 1840, and he was a one-term congressman in 1846. However, as we said earlier, he did not discuss, he did not uh, support the Mexican War in 1846 or the spread of slavery. Uh, his connection to the Whig party after 1846 was fraying rapidly. Southern Whigs wanted slavery to expand and most Northern Whigs did not. Uh, sectional loyalty is becoming more important than party loyalty here. Uh, and Whigs of course are still key players uh, in the compromise of 1850, admitting California as a free state, eliminating the slave trade in DC, the Utah and New Mexican territories could decide for themselves if slavery would be allowed, and a new fugitive slave law that required Northerners to help catch runaway slave people were part of this compromise of 1850. In 1854, though, the Kansas-Nebraska Act pretty much destroyed the Whig Party and led to divisions within the Democratic Party as well. In general, Southern Whigs supported Kansas-Nebraska, and many Whigs left to join the new Republican Party, including Lincoln in 1856. Lincoln also campaigned for the, Whig, for the uh, Republican candidate for president, who we mentioned the other day, John C. Fremont. Uh, Buchanan did win the election, but Fremont made a good showing, and it was pretty evident at this point that the Republican Party was not a fluke. They were not going to go away. And Kansas-Nebraska Act is what brought Lincoln back into politics. He constantly discussed his beliefs uh, on the place of slavery and African Americans in society, freedom in a republic, and the value of the Constitution and the preservation of the Union. The Kansas-Nebraska Act created a firestorm. As uh, James McPherson, the Civil War historian, called it the most important single event pushing the nation toward a civil war. Why? Primarily because it repealed the Missouri Compromise, Missouri Compromise, and allowed slavery into parts of the nation where it had been prohibited. Uh, the architect of this act, Stephen Douglas, had the goal of organizing these territories encouraging settlement throughout them, and this would allow for railroads to come through his home state of Illinois, Mosquito, uh, with a hub in Chicago. Without repealing the Missouri Compromise, Douglas, oh my God, Douglas faced, uh, he probably would not have been able to get slave state congressmen to support the act. So Douglas argued that repealing Missouri Compromise wouldn't really matter because so few slave owners would want to go to these regions because the climate and the soil are just not good for farming. Of course, this is not true. And moreover, Kansas-Nebraska Act allowed regions to decide for themselves popular sovereignty. This was his argument why this, uh, this act should pass. But in 1854, Lincoln addressed the Kansas-Nebraska Act in Peora, Illinois, signaling his opposition to the act and his re-entry into politics. 
in the speech, he gives uh, discusses the debates over slavery in the territories, why the Kansas Act, Kansas Nebraska Act, was wrong as well as dangerous. He discusses how he believes slavery is wrong. Also, he states he has no animosity toward the Southern people. He acknowledges that Northerners would do the same thing if the roles were reversed. And he's still somewhat a supporter of colonization at this colonization efforts, uh, but he does recognize them as impractical. And finally, he states how he does support the Missouri Compromise. We should reinstate this. We should keep the Missouri Compromise, but also how he supports fugitive slave laws. So I'll read just a couple lines from a few different paragraphs. Zeal for the spread of slavery, I cannot but hate. I hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. I hate it because it deprives our Republican example of its just influence in the world, enables the enemy of free institutions with plausibility to taunt us as hypocrites, causes the real freedom, friends of freedom to doubt our sincerity, and especially because it forces so many good men among ourselves with an open war into the very fundamental principles of civil liberty, criticizing the Declaration of Independence. So he's saying not only is slavery wrong and evil, it makes the United States look like a bunch of hypocrites to other nations. Before also, he says, as I mentioned earlier, before proceeding, let me say I think I have no prejudice against the Southern people. They are just what we would be in their situation. And then when he gets on to saying what to do with slavery and enslaved people, my first impulse would be to free all the slaves and then send them to Liberia, to their own native land. But a moment's reflection would convince me that whatever of high hope there may be in this, in the long run, is sudden execution is impossible. If they were all landed there in a day, they would all perish in the next 10 days. And there are not a supply, shipping, and surplus money enough in the world to carry them there in many times 10 days, a 10 day trip across the ocean. Having the ships to move these people would be impossible. And finally, most men, some men, mostly Whigs, who condemn the repeal of the Missouri Compromise, nevertheless hesitate to go for its restoration, lest they be thrown in the company of abolitionists. Will they allow me, an old wig, to tell them good-humoredly that I think this is very silly? Stand with anybody that stands right. Stand with him where, while he is right and part with him when he goes wrong. Stand with the abolitionist in restoring the Missouri Compromise and stand against him when he attempts to repeal the fugitive slave law. So I'll leave you with that and we will reconvene this coming Monday. Hope everyone has a great weekend and take care.